Good morning and welcome to this latest edition of Elephant in the Room. And uh, uh, today it's my, my great pleasure to be joined by one of our most prolific uh, authors and uh, uh, an analyst of our general condition, uh, Nanjala Nyabola. Uh, Nanjala is author of Digital Democracy Analog Politics. It was published in 2018 and she'll be telling us a bit more about that. But uh, it's exciting. This coming Thursday, uh, she's launching uh, her latest book called Traveling While Black. Uh, very topical at this time in the world. And uh, Nanjala is also a political analyst and activist and uh, general uh, analyst of, of, of the human condition. Asante Sana and Karibu this morning, Nanjala. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. Uh, Nanjala, let me just start with, a, with a, just a, a, you know, an open question. Um, uh, it flows out of your, 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 your great first book, Digital Democracy and Analog Politics. Uh, and, and I'd first go back and ask, uh, what made you choose that title? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, picking titles for books is always a tricky one. Um, I wanted a title that sort of captured the energy of the book. And the energy of the book really is about this friction that happens, I think, in Kenya between who Kenya is and who Kenya wants to be or who Kenya purports to be. And this whole, for example, this whole digital government, digital society thing, for me, was just one of the most potent examples of that friction. Yeah. Because I think we had this administration come in with big promises about how everything was going to be digital and we're going to leapfrog and do all of these things. And yeah. then what we're living in now is the consequences of unmet aspirations, of yes. frustrations, of, you know, over-promising and under-delivering. But yeah. it's not just Kenya, right? Kenya was the example. Yeah. This is a global thing that yeah. the digital promises so much, but people who work in the digital space act almost as if it is abstract from the reality of human beings and the institutions that we build. Yeah. And so the whole, the title basically just shows that there is this tension and this friction between how we try to treat the digital as this agnostic, uh, super powerful thing. But in reality, it is we who build it, and it's yeah, right. we who use it, and it's going right. to reflect us <laughs> and our foibles and our limitations and our creativity and our agency and things like that. So yes. that's what the book is really about. It's not, I, I always, when I give talks, I always tell people, I'm not a techie. It's not a book that's going to teach you how to code. It's not yes. going to teach you, you know, what algorithms and AI and whatever I can do, but it's going to show you that we can't, write about tech without thinking about people and without thinking about institutions yeah. um and then and as a consequence about politics yeah. and and that's really what the book is about um my editor didn't initially love the title she, she said it was too long yes <laughs> and it's four words come yes. on um, <laughs> but but i think it's actually worked out for the best because yeah. i think people pick it up and they get it and they're yes. like oh there's going to be a tension in here and, and yes. that sort of carries through the book yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, and I get you. I mean, I, I've been involved in anti-corruption work for, you know, uh, what, over 24 years now. Um, and wow. one, of, one of the things that has struck, struck me that for a while there, people talked of, uh, of, of digitization of the net as almost like a silver bullet for governance that, you know, if missed, okay. Um, um, you know, that we, we could even have elections with our, little, with our fingerprints, uh, digitize everything. And, and, mm -hmm. and I realize you can't digitize integrity. You know, if it's a bunch of you, people running the system, uh, they're still better. They're actually, it's, it's, it's better for crooks. Uh, it's better you, for them. They yeah. actually become more efficient crooks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, and so, I mean, uh, I know that's a question I wanted to, you know, to put to you. I mean, um, Kenya prides itself and, and is looked up to by many other African countries as sort of, you know, we, we are the Silicon Savannah, you know, we are the, we are the M-Pesa, home of M-Pesa, you, know, um, you know, mobile phone penetration rates of 120%, smartphones, you know, all, all, all our stats in terms of digital, you know, we're, we're up there. Yeah. The government has rolled out the e-citizen, you know, government has rolled out a whole range of programs of digitizing everything. Yeah. 
who do my number, of course, being the most um, most most well known and currently yes. used. But you know, um, what are the most profound lessons that emerged yes. for you um, when you when you when you think about um, the application of this technology to solve? some of our major problems in society, like, you know, wh whether it's, it's, you know, like our, our elections, where yeah. I mean, there are tremendous examples of the catastrophic failure of digital systems in carrying yeah. out elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to just, you know, what, what, what lessons do you draw from our, our grand leap into using digital technology to solve our governance and life problems? <laughs> One thing that I always emphasize to people is you can't understand the role that technology is playing in a society without understanding that society. You have to understand the people, you have to understand the institutional context, you have to understand the historical context. Because what we saw in Kenya was, you know, that idea that if we just throw tech at yeah. this generational problem, at yeah. these complex social problems, that these problems will go away. Yeah. And in fact, like we said at the top, they actually became compounded. Yeah. They actually became more intense. And yeah. you know, we look at the promise of the first digital election, for example, and resulting in the death of a senior bureaucrat, the assassination, really, of a senior bureaucrat. Chris, we Chris, saw um, Chris, Chris Sando. Yeah, and we saw, for example, one of the most powerful moments for me because um, I have legal training, I have a, a law degree, and so I watched the, and I, I will always resent Kenya for making me use my law degree. Yeah. Um, I watched most of the proceedings of the Supreme Court hearing. And there was this moment when the Chief Justice, Justice Maraga, said, you know, give, us, give them access to the, it was almost like 10 o'clock at night, yeah. we need to conduct an audit, approved the, the opposition's request for an audit of the results and um, the lawyers for the IEBC said your honor we cannot open the servers because the servers are in France and the people in France are asleep <laughs> I've never forgotten that sentence because to me it's just really emblematic of how tech can compound certain uh, um, sociological sort of I guess orientations is probably the most neutral word that it can create this black box into which we put in all of this information yeah. that makes it easier for people who want to manipulate political and social outcomes to yeah. do it without scrutiny. So up till this day, ordinary people don't understand how the tech the technology works. Like Chris Sunder tried very hard to explain that and yeah. he lost his life, yeah. right? Because he was, in fact, the night that he died, he was on television yeah. giving a presentation about the, the election. Yeah. Um, you think about, uh, IFMIS and the Auditor General saying on uh, uh, during a Senate hearing, it is neither integrated nor does it help me manage anything. You know, the former Auditor General saying this is just, it's a black box into which I as an auditor can yeah. no longer um, audit anything. Yeah. And so, but then there's also good stuff, right? We have all of these new conversations about identity and belonging. I mean, we, we are having conversations, it's made space for us to have conversations that the traditional media because of state capture mm -hmm. have not made possible. You couldn't have up open conversations about corruption in the state um, mm -hmm. for many years because the media of the state capture of the media, you couldn't have these, uh, the amount of whistleblowing that we've had mm -hmm. in the last, you know, five or six years. I mean, it's just skyrocketed because people have finally have a space to do this stuff. So the most fundamental lesson is go back to the people, yeah. go back to the society, start with what is happening in the historical and the social context and how is tech going, tech, tech, uh, the digital technology in its purest form is an intensifier, yeah. which means it's going to intensify whatever it finds in that society. Mm. If there was this hunger for uh, uh, transparency, it would have intensified that. But yeah. instead, what we're seeing is that we had a political context where there was this great desire for uh, people to escape culpability, for you know corruption to be made easier, for lack of transparency, and, and a public that wanted to build a new way of being Kenyan, of feeling Kenyan, of belonging, of identity, and things like that. Yeah. And so all of the good and the bad and the ugly became intensified. Yes. Um, 
So that's the most important lesson. And, and, and it's not just Kenya, like Kenya is the example that I use in the book, but all over the world, look at what is happening with far, the far right in Europe. Look at what is happening with, um, you know, state control and censorship in Asia. Like whatever it finds in the specific society, whatever yeah. impetus it finds in that society, it's going to intensify. Uh, yeah, I just want, want to, 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 to pick up on, on, on just something that you mentioned. Tech, tech is an intensifier. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, it captures it, captures it really well, and it captures the good, the bad, the ugly. Then, um, mm. uh, but you, you said you, you're, you're not a techie, you know, you don't teach people how to code, uh, and you have this sort of, you know, wide and eclectic background. Um, what is, what is this technology and, and, and this intensification doing to, um, the generation, which 75% of Africans are below the age of 35, what's it doing to them? Mm. Um, you know, how is it changing their outlook? Yeah. Um, you know, their, how, their sense of them, their, their understanding and sense of themselves and what the world is and their place in it. Yeah. You know, again, you, you see both extremes. Um, so I've, in a past sort of professional life, done training for activists who do um, who collect information and 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 build citizen uh, journalism networks and things like that. And one of the things that tech has made amazing and has done tremendously well for young people is that it's opened up a whole new wave of activism. So you think about uh, movements like Roads Must Fall. You think about movements like uh, Black Lives Matter. You think about movements like um, My Dress My Choice. Like young people who didn't have access to traditional and institutional platforms have turned to technology the hong kong protests for example you know being led by people who are like 19 20 years old black lives matter movement leaders are in their early 20s uh, you know mid 20s like it's opened up a space for political action for young people that had been closed off for so long and that young people are able to find each other the black lives movement in black lives matter movement in the united states giving young people in France who have been, you know, subject to systemic racism for so many years, a framework to think about their place in society. Yeah. Roads must fall in South Africa, giving people in Zimbabwe a framework to understand the decolonization process, the stalled decolonization in, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Like we're seeing this transnational, Lucia Ardisi, um, you know, working with Jean Marais in Senegal. Yeah. There's a transnationalism um, and, and a public facing transnationalism that's happening amongst young people that is tremendous to see. That they are reclaiming their future from a generation that had abandoned them, right? Yeah. Greta, you know, school strikes, um, saying to people that climate change is not just in your future, but it's gonna be our reality in 20 years. We're gonna die yes. if we don't get off this path. Um, so that's the good stuff. That's like the, the, the stuff that I think is, it has been really wonderful. It's intensified political participation for young people, public political participation for young people where traditional paths to political action were closed off because of you know ageism you know you guys don't know go and do this first go to university first yes. go and do this 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 before we even let you uh, aspire towards parliament before we even let you aspire towards the presidency yes. um look at uh, uh, alexander ocasio cortez yes. you know she's 20, 29 years old when she runs for office yes. and she's still being told people in the senate i mean even her own party is telling her you know sit down the girl we don't, meanwhile, she's built a movement. She's yeah. literally just built a whole movement, a national movement that has galvanized young people and is transforming left-leaning politics in the United States. The bad stuff that we're seeing is that some of the lines of fracture that exist in societies are becoming more intense generationally because you have these people, young people who are fed in the steady diet of social division and, um, uh, separatism or whatever yeah. and because there's nothing there's no alternative there's nothing that's telling them this is not the right way to do it because of this there's the traditional the, the reason why i spend at least two chapters in my book talking about traditional media yeah. is because i think it's so easy to lose sight of the role of journalism as a pillar of democracy yeah. like it's not just about moving copy or you know headlines whatever it is actually part of the whole idea of a democratic state. Yeah. And so I look at countries like Ethiopia, for example, 
whereby because of the state capture and the collapse of mainstream media, a lot of young people get their news almost exclusively from social media. Right. Whether you're talking about Telegram, or you're talking about Facebook, or you're talking about you know websites that are being run by people who have overtly partisan um, my tattoos, um, overtly partisan um, interests. I live yeah. near Big <laughs> Um and what you see is that. Um, now, when the lines of fracture come to a head, yes. um, these young people are already primed for conflict and yeah. they're already primed for that um, uh, tension, are already primed to, for violence. Yeah. And, you know, Ethiopia is a, is a place where, I mean, I went to Ethiopia and Sudan very close together a couple of years ago, literally within six weeks of each other. Yes. And both of them at the time were military regimes with large young populations who are incredibly frustrated with the military regimes yeah. and the anger was palpable. But I always thought that Ethiopia would have a revolution before Sudan mm. because the, the Ethiopian um, um, energy, it was just, they had been this massive generational shift that didn't remember the Derg didn't remember what came before and just knew this dissatisfaction with the now. Yes. And both of those countries are two of the largest um, senders of, of migrants and refugees in Africa. Yes. Like the, they send, young people are fleeing these, have been fleeing these countries in waves and waves and waves. Yes. Many of those young people are getting their information from social media. And that has very serious consequences for the kind of political discourse that is possible. Yeah. That, you know, right now, the ethne, the ethnic identity in a lot of fractured societies, ethno-nationalist discourse is having a resurgence in young people. And they're becoming um, just as, if not more mm -hmm. ethnic, uh, you know, than their predecessors, yeah. because there's nothing out there to say, here is a different way of thinking about your society. Yeah. Here is a different way of orienting yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think we had in Kenya, we have had a wave of, for the last 10, 15 years, social media was a great place where people could see that actually you could think about yourself outside your ethnic group, that you didn't yeah. have to confine yourself to these notions. Since 2017, I think we've seen a bit of a, of a backslide. Oh. I look at some of these things. I do. I think I look at some of the things that are coming across uh, my Facebook and are coming across, and I'm really mostly on these, some of these platforms uh, out of curiosity because some of the things that come in Facebook, some of the things that are coming in on WhatsApp, some of the things that are coming in on um, uh, even Twitter more and more yes. are to me, they might seem benign, yes. but to me, our manifestation of a shifting, the tectonic plates have shifted a little bit since 2017. Okay. Because remember what happened after 2017 was that the police went on a killing spree in a lot of Luo, mm. um, predominantly Luo, but, and then people went on social media and told Luo people that they were making that stuff up. And so we had this hashtag Luo Lives Matter and people mm. trying to reclaim space and, blah, 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 and journalists getting, you know, running to the editor's room and getting protected by the, like there was a whole week of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gaslighting. Mm. Like we knew that the killings were happening. We knew that the cops were going door to door in Madare, in yes. parts of Kisumu, and, and we were being gaslit by the traditional media and being told we were making this stuff up. Yeah. And I think that has affected the con political consciousness in a way that is manifesting now with a lot more overt ethno-nationalist discourse online than there was before 2017. Mm -hmm. That people are, are, you don't see the scars, but you don't necessarily, we didn't acknowledge the wound, yes. but the scars are becoming much, much more evident in subtle ways. Yes. And, um, I feel like a lot of people left the 2017 election battered. battered. And yeah, I mean, I think people don't even realize that first, the, the, that between August um, 15th and September 
first. Uh, I think it was the first when the Supreme Court ruling came down. First of seven, yeah. It was just, yeah, it was just this very weird battering of the public consciousness that was happening. And then again in October. Yes. Um, so those are things that make me think that what's going, what's, what was, what could have been a moment of building a new social consciousness yes. has been seriously damaged by the way in which those discourses played out online. Okay. And I think that we are, um, same as Ethiopia, um, same as Somalia, you see this in Somalia all the time, okay that the ethno-nationalist consciousness has found space on the digital that it didn't have um, five years ago, three years ago. Yes. And um, I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but it's just something that I've been paying attention to um, for the last couple of years. Yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, um, interesting and, and disturbing because um, um, I have followed a, a little bit of you know, what's, what's been happening, of course, here. And yes, one can see these cleavages. Uh, but Ethiopia as well, it's very difficult to have a conversation about what's going on there. Because, you know, yeah. Yeah, the Oromos and Haras, it, it's very, very, mm -hmm. very polarized. But, yeah. uh, but still, um, maybe head back, if, 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 if you can tell me, you know, if, if you can just give a pers your perspective on um, um, what benefit, um, how this generation has benefited uh, from this technology. Mm. I always tell my, my, my friends from, from the West who, who are very concerned about issues of, of privacy uh, and all these mm. apps and the internet and, and mobile telephony. And I say that, you know, I said, listen, in Africa, that's not the concern. Um, it's, it's, mm. it's not the primary concern when people are talking about their social media and Facebook hoovering up. Cambridge Analytica, yes, it, 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 you know, people, for us still, uh, uh, as you said, you know, it, it, it's an incredible political space uh, yeah. for this course that uh, was not possible for this generation. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, are there examples of places where it, you know, where it has done good? I mean, you know, I mean, for me, uh, Black Lives Matter, I mean, let's face it, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, white policemen and, uh, uh, you know, and gangs of whites have been killing black people in America for hundreds of years. Mm. Mm. But all, mm. all of a sudden, you know, um, George Floyd has that knee on his, ne on his neck for how many minutes, mm. for eight minutes. Uh, mm. And, and an, an entire world um, responds. And, 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 it's mobilized. And, mm. yeah. um, and so I wanted to ask, you know, I mean, um because you, you know you 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 study these trends in our society um mm. you, know, you can see some of the negative stuff that's going on um how do you flip this yeah i, I mean that's a great question yeah. i think that um my theory my hypothesis has always been that the main reason why young people in africa especially um but also in asia have been able to use social media as a, a place to mobilize, and even in Latin America, I would say, as a place to mobilize politically, is because the companies that build those apps don't think of these as places where they need to be invested in. So they basically left us alone. Oh. And because I go back to my original point about agency and creativity, yes. and People were looking around their societies and not seeing a place where they could be political, where they could be radical, where they could be open about their radical whatever. And then here was this platform that the, 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 the that power conceived of as a place where people were sharing pictures of food and yeah. clothes and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they took that, they took that opening and they just ran with it. Yeah. And um, I think that is what um, allowed for all of this space for people to do amazing things they're talking about the arab spring lucha aldice yon marais yeah. um, um you know rose must fall uh, all of these movements is it's really a reflection of the fact that young people are very creative and are very smart and yeah. if you give them the the right tools they will they will literally just overturn your government say you know what yes. a better way is possible yes. um i think the problem is the risk the problem is now these companies companies are realizing that we are 
more crucially that we are markets. And there's something that Reverend Joya says, um, said once that has always stayed with me. He says, Kenya was create, created as a market, as part of the market for all of these goods yep. and not as a nation state. Yes. And we haven't stopped thinking about ourselves primarily as a market. It's a very capitalistic orientation, right? Yep. We exist to be consumed yes. by more powerful com- countries. We're not human beings who deserve freedom and prosperity and peace and all of these things. Yes. And I think what is happening is that these tech companies are now realizing that quote unquote, the rest of the world can be a market, not a place where people live, not a place where people have political aspirations, a mm. market. Yeah. I'll give you an example of what I mean by this tension. Mm. The end SARS movement in Nigeria is a fantastic example. Yeah, it's a fantastic example of how the growing international consciousness on police brutality, especially in the post-colonial framework, um, that it's rooted in something deeper. It is systemic, it is a systemic conflict uh, targeting young black people, whether they are in Africa, whether they're in Europe, whether they are in Asia, whether they are in Latin America. That that thread that starts with uh, Black Lives Matter, and I'd even take it back to before George Floyd, that thread goes, you know, to France with, um, um, I think his name is um, uh, Amadou, Amadou as say, it goes, you know, Diallo, that we're seeing this, this idea of police brutality against young black people is an anti-black um, um, consciousness that is embedded in the logic of the nation state, the Western nation state. So, you have this consciousness, you have young Nigerian people, you know, realizing, looking up, articulating publicly, demanding from, yes. you know, uh, the administration, stop killing us. Yes. Stop killing us, stop extorting us, yes. stop this systemic violence against us. Yes. They are t- the, the online, because the traditional media is not gonna cover it, is not gonna give them this platform. You have parliamentarians going to parliament, you know, talking down to them and things like that. So the only place where they can have this conversation is online. Okay. What ended up happening? Mark Zuckerberg, a few years ago, flew to Lagos, and yeah. then he came to Nairobi. Yeah. He met with government officials. He met with a handful of pre-selected coders, yes. and then he flew out. In Nairobi, I think he was here for only about eight hours or nine hours. He was in in the morning. He was out in the afternoon. Yes. Met with Joe Mishari, left. Yes. When people went online, hashtag MSARS. Yes. Facebook, and their spokesperson admitted this, suppressed posts that had the hashtag end SARS. They were literally hiding that content from the search page. And they literally, they admitted this. They said, we we are, we don't know what's happening, but all the stuff that was on Facebook, that was on Instagram, that was hashtag end SARS was being suppressed. Okay. That is what happens when... (laughs) The company realizes that this is a market, but the best way to access that market is to align ourselves with power, is to align ourselves with the institute, with whoever who has power in that society. And this is the tension that we're moving into with Africa, with Latin America, with, um, uh, because our protest movements do not advance the capitalist agenda of these social networking firms. You know, hashtag Black Lives Matter doesn't make Twitter or Facebook money. What does make them money is alliances with the ministry of the ICT to be the primary provider of internet um, services in places that cannot be reached, right? It's the balloons, it's the the free basics. That's that's where it's advertising. But, and so this is the tension that we're walking into. And I always tell activists and uh, use the platforms because they exist but use them with a consciousness that these are capitalist institutions that are designed to make money. And when the push comes to shove and the choice is between your political agenda and their capitalist interests, they're going to pick their capitalist interests. This is, this is why I say to people like, use them, but don't make the consciousness, don't make the political activism, don't make the mobilization wholly dependent on the existence of these social networking firms. They're not for you. They're not 
doing this for you. <laughs> They're doing this to make money. And um, you have to, you have to sort of always just kind of have that. Um, and and SARS is just the latest example. This is happening with other hashtags as well. Um, and it's going to keep happening because the most, unlike in the, in the US where um, this, the argument on, um, that's what I'm looking for, the argument on, uh, it's the C word, I'm blanking, but be, through the era of the civil rights movement into the modern era, there's been this growing push for corporate accountability in the United States. Yeah. And so at the very least, at the very least, corporations have to look progressive, right? They have to do um, Black Lives Matter, uh, change their profile pictures, and they have to put out all this stuff about greenwashing and pinkwashing and all this stuff to appear progressive. Yes. Um, we don't have that here. No. We don't have that here. <laughs> and, so, and so the most powerful is the state. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, this this uh, net neutrality, um, issue. Um, um, Nanjala, what, you know, what, what you're saying is troubling. I mean, essentially Facebook was, was, was suppressing uh, NSARS so that it doesn't upset uh, the Nigerian government, basically. Uh, because, um, but they've made, they've, been, they made, they've made an offer. Uh, Facebook has made an offer in terms of providing internet to um, remote regions where it is difficult to access. I know they did in India first, and India sort of thought about it, set up a committee, it thought about it and said, um, no. And mm -hmm. I have seen that it's now, that the offer has come to us here. Yeah, it's been here for a while. It, 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 uh, I, would like, I, would like, I would like your opinion. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if you are, um, Nanjala Nyabola was called up by the Ministry of ICT, um, tell us, okay, uh, Nanjala, uh, should, we pick, should we be picking this up uh, or should we not uh, and why? So the thing that bothered me most about Free Basics, and I've written about this um, for foreign policy, the thing that bothered me the most about Free Basics was that it wasn't the internet. It no. was a curated version of the internet. Yeah. And as a person who curates, you know, I actively curate my social media. I, I know what the power of curation is. Yeah. That curation is not just uh, picking things and putting them together. You're telling a story without saying everything explicitly. Yes. And the, the logic behind the curation was always that it would advance, first of all, Facebook's commercial interests, then Facebook's partners' commercial interests, then finally, 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 you know, the public interest. And I think the dangers are, and, and, and just, it's pretty obvious what the dangers, and this is what India was flagging, was that what you're doing is you're creating two lanes of internet that people who are able to buy their way into like reliable internet access are up here, you're on the super highway, you are, you are, you know, you're on that new uh, whatever that they're building to, to evacuate. Right. Um, you're up here, you've, you've bought your way out of the traffic. And the people who are not able to pay that are down here using a substandard version of the internet, using a, a, a curated version of the internet. Yes. The trouble with AI curated uh, internet is in inherent in everything that's happened on Facebook over the last, and not just Facebook, um, Instagram, you know, some of these other platforms, yes. that the AI is not curating for the public. The algorithm is not curating for the public interest. Yes. It is curating for the commercial interest. Yes. All the way until the day before the U.S. election or like the week before the U.S. election, when all of these, you know, Facebook has been under a lot of pressure um, around hate speech and mobilization of hate speech. Yes. And all until that week before the US election, the top 10 websites yes. on Facebook were always misinformation sites. It was yeah. always Breitbart News, it was always Drudge Report, it was always these things. Yeah. And like, unlike a lot of, I don't, it's not, I don't see it as like, it's not someone sitting in a room somewhere saying, you know, push Drudge, yes. push Breitbart. No, it's because the algorithm is, is is designed to privilege whatever generates the most content, uh, whatever generates the most engagement. Yes. And unfortunately, the thing that generates the most engagement is things that make us angry. Yes. It's, it's hate speech. It's things that get us fired up. Yes. And so 
this is the the tension of allowing people who are not who don't have an institution that does not have the public interest embedded in its operational logic curating the internet for poor people because you're just going to have a replication of that energy on the internet you're going to open up a can of worms that you're not prepared to do and remember what i said at the top the internet is an intensifier yeah. unfortunately millions billions of people in the world are not that great we're not great people <laughs> like there are many people who are driven yeah. by hate and are driven by by anger and are driven by misogyny and are driven by homophobia and all of these things and then you take them and you give them a curated version of the internet where that is what drives traffic where that is what drives engagement where that is what drives the conversation it's a recipe for disaster mm. that's what happened in in in, in myanmar this mm. is what's happening in a lot of countries um, around the world yes. and that's that is the problem with this free internet okay. it's not free yeah. just because you're not paying in money doesn't mean that you're not paying in other costs yes. uh, economists talk about negative externalities yes. that the, the the externality might not be in cash it yes. will be in you will pay in something else. You'll pay in the blood of your citizens. Exactly. You will pay in, you know, but someone has to pay for it. There's no such thing as free. It's yeah. just that you're paying for it in a different way. Um, great. Well, um, um, Nanjala, uh, as, I, as I knew, <laughs> we answered one question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, and and, and I'd like to say thank you very much and, and invite you. Um, uh, we haven't talked about your, your new book, so I am, no. you know, we just have to set up a, another appointment ASAP um, to talk about the U.S. elections uh, and, and you know, also the Tanzanian elections and the role of social media there. Yeah. And also, you know, your new book, Traveling While, While Back, Black. And I also wanted to ask you about the COVID-19 uh, disruption and what its implications are. So, as you said, yes. we, didn't get, we didn't get very far, but very, very, very rich. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Jana, and uh, I'm sure we'll be speaking again. Absolutely. <laughs>